Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, the Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to our week three gallery talk about fiber and wearable arts. We're finding that it's an extremely popular art form with our audience this year. And we have three very talented, inspiring instructors who are gonna speak with you about their craft, their version of fiber art, what they do as professionals and what they and their students are doing this week. Uh, our first fiber artist is Gail Matthews, who happens to be one of my dear partners at Off Track Art Gallery. If you're in downtown Westminster, you can't miss us. We keep art at the heart of downtown Westminster. We're right in the triangle between O'Lourdens, Johansson's, and the public library. We're called off track art because we're right next to the railroad tracks. And I, I still get a thrill as an adult whenever the trains go by and I go out and the engineers blow the whistle for me. Um, Gail has been doing fiber arts for some time. My partners and I became aware of her because we were doing the famous local mistletoe mark together. And she does these whimsical animals that just they have such character and vitality. Um, Gail's gonna to speak to you about her love of yarn and making these creatures tonight. Take it away, Gail. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, um, except that this week we didn't do those 3D whimsical sculptures. We did something different. So we threw traditions. Um, I've been teaching 2D needle felting, which is a departure from my usual 3D sculptural work. I consider myself still a bit of a, of a novice in this particular form of needle felting. And since my students all had some previous experience with needle felting in one way or another, um, we all shared previous experiences and we enjoyed the wonderful camaraderie of sharing ideas and tips and some added blue skies where there was only a green pasture and one student did a, a beagle instead of, or excuse me, a King Charles Spaniel instead of a, uh, uh, a bunny rabbit, which is just fine because she had the skill and the ability to do that. And so we've just had a ball working on our sculptures, which are, 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 are pictures, which I'll show you in just a minute. I'm going to start my timer so I can keep track of time. Well, my students have always seemed to really love needle felting. And that is because the medium provides such, I don't know, uh, one student re, uh, commented this week on how relaxing and meditative needle felting is, because really you just get a needle and you just repeatedly stab your fiber. And um, so really it's very freeing of your mind, but you also focus obviously, but it's, it's just very, very relaxing. Um, it is actually like painting with wool. It's accessible to anybody, and that's why I think needle felting is for is the perfect art form for those who, um, you know, are maybe in their later decades, like I am, <laughs> never have had formal art training, and for those who say I'm not artistic. Yes, you can produce something beautiful and creative that gives you great pleasure and joy, and uh, a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. That's not to say there's not a learning curve because there is, but as any trained artist understands, you learn to train your eye and you learn to look at pictures and you pick up shading and highlighting and where the, where the light falls. And that's all part of, of the artistic process. Um, but you don't, need to, you don't need to know how to draw because the computer these days or any picture, there are many techniques and methods to transfer a picture onto your felting base fabric. For example, uh, it's not really a good picture of the light, but this is, uh, this is a free picture from Unsplash. And this was the rabbit that we were going to, that we started to do today. 
cut out of the background and all you have to do is just felt around it and um you know mark where the eyes go and the nose and and so on and there you have it so you don't you don't even need to know how to draw to do this which is very freeing for people i think who lack the confidence or maybe train skill to do particular art so why wool why not oils why not acrylics well I have painted with oils and I, at the time, I loved it. Um, and I love to paint. I don't do it very much, but wool is an amazing, amazing medium for the expression of sculpture and wool painting. And then if you get into wet felting, you can make hats and slippers and garments and purses. Um, you can do almost anything imaginable, which is just amazing. You can, dry felt 3D, you can dry felt 2D, you can wet felt, um, which then your fabric that you make through wet felting can be further embellished with uh, more 2D needle felting. And then if you combine the processes, you get, you get endless possibilities, endless possibilities more possibilities for creative outlet and creative um, projects than you could do in a dozen lifetimes, which, you know, I mean, I it really, the sky's the limit. Felting is essentially tangling and condensing wool fiber used into, into a dense fabric. Needle felting, excuse me, wet felting is a little bit different, but it's still the tangling of fabric, uh, of the wool fibers to make a fabric. The needles used in wool felting are long, okay, and at the very end, from about here on down, they have a cutout on them. Now, if I look at it from this distance, I can't even see it. It's really hard to see it unless it's really up close. But the cutout is either spiral, a star shape, or a triangle. The needles are also different thicknesses. A 42 is very fine and going back, let's see, 42, then going down to a 36 or even a 34, they get denser and denser. Okay. So what you do is, since the needles have barbs on the end, cutouts, and the wool that you're using is very, very fibrous, and also wool density a fiber is measured in microns. Now, you know, micron, microscope <laughs> is something you can't see with your naked eye. But if you looked at an individual uh, fiber under a microscope, you could see that the fiber of the wool itself is layered and, and has little barbs on it. So when you, when you stab into a piece of wool with a barbed needle and you have loose fibers that also kind of are layered and barbed, then as you pull out your needle, you're tangling those fibers. And the more you stab, the denser and the tighter things are compacted. And pretty soon, if you work at it long enough, you can get a piece of fabric that is so dense, you can hardly cut it with a pair of scissors. So, you know, uh, the, 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 the scope of felting loosely to felting hardly is it hardy it hard is very uh very broad um so that's the basic principle of needle felting that is not the principle of wet felting because you don't use needles you use you use agitation with your hands um but that's a different subject and we aren't going to go there tonight um so Wool is highly sculptable because the more you poke it in one place, the more it condenses. And where you don't poke it, it's a little bit raised. So you can sculpt really just about anything, which is to me, I prefer to a uh, 3D sculpting with felt. Um, but maybe if I get used to the wool painting, I'll really like that too. I mean, I like it, but I'm better at the animal making. So with wool painting, it's really the whole principle is just like painting. You use dark wool for shadows. You use light wool for highlights and where the light falls. 
And, you know, with a practiced eye, and if you observe the picture that you've chosen to do, uh, really you can develop quite a bit of skill. And from a distance, a really well felted um, 2D painting, wool painting, has been confused by a number of people. Uh, I've heard people tell stories about how certain artists have taken their work to shows and people can't believe they're made out of wool because they look like, they honestly look like they are painted. Um, one of the aspects of using wool I love is the texture. I heard somebody say once, and I don't remember the source, but in this modern age where everything is sleek and smooth and you just run your fingers across the screen of your phone and everything is just gentle touch and corn, uh, furnishings are, are hard lines and metal and industrial, there's not a lot of texture out there. And so a lot of younger people actually love this medium because it adds, it, it gives them that satisfaction of having something to touch that has texture. Um, 2D felting can be put on to just about any fabric uh, that's not too dense. You can use linen as your base fabric. You can use wool. Um, what I use, uh, what our classes did use today is a product that is sold by one of my favorite suppliers called Flat Mat. And it's basically a pre-felt mat. Um, you could use cotton. Dense fabrics like canvas and, and heavy denim wouldn't be uh, serviceable simply because they're too dense for those delicate needles to go through. But the whole point of, of being able to use a variety of fabrics is you can embellish just about anything. You can embellish shirts, placemats, um, you know, hats, uh, anything. Okay. Uh, and another thing about wool being a really great medium for non-artists <laughs> is that it's extremely forgiving. You know, if you make a mistake um, with watercolor, for example, um, you may have to you may have to start over. Or if you blot ink on something, you're doing pen and ink. Well, oh my goodness, you know that's a disaster. But with wool. If there's something you don't like, if there's a shape or a color, something didn't work, something's not right, the angle's not right, um, your, your perspective is off, okay? You just get a handy dandy seam ripper and you rip it off and then you start all over again. So, you know, it's very forgiving, very forgiving. Um, to start 2D needle felting, it's really very simple. You need needles, you need a base fabric, you need a felting surface, and of course you need wool and a subject. That's it. However, I, I have one caveat to offer, and that is that needle felting is highly addictive. <laughs> and I, I'm a bona fide wool addict. I have over 250 um, hanks of wool in so many colors and types that it makes me dizzy sometimes just to look at them which for me it's eye candy i just love to look at my wool because the colors are just so vibrant and then when you add other fibers like silk and some synthetic fibers to that and then you add um curls which curls are uh und are dyed or undyed raw washed, true, but raw, uncarded sheep curls. And they add all kinds of fun and dimension to uh, really anything you do. Um, so I'm addicted. I think I ought to be a founding member of Woolaholics Anonymous. I think there would be some people who would be willing to join me on that. Now I'd like to show you a couple examples of um, this week's first project, and then the second project, was, which is still a work in process. Um, for my prototype, I made this. It's a, it's a lamb portrait, lamb head portrait in a meadow. Now, that was my prototype, and I kind of made a mistake on it in the sense that I didn't leave myself an edge. So it's going to be a little bit hard to actually use uh, for anything, 
but I got a little smarter as I went along. And this is the one I completed in class today. As you can see, two done by the same artist coming up with two very different perspectives. And uh, so that was very, very much fun um, for all of us. Our next project that we're doing uh, this Wednesday through Friday is a, a, a sitting rabbit or bunny. And I've got my background in, which is full of movement and beautiful curls. It's almost all curls. And I've just started my rabbit um, in the center there. So that's what I'll be working on in the next few days. Here's a rooster that I did some time ago, uh, a few months ago. And that also has a lot of movement in it because of the curls, the beautiful curls that mimic uh, the rooster feathers. And um, so those are some of the projects we have been doing and what I have done in the past. Um, as far as any history of the, pro of, of the art, it's age old. I don't know how old, but people have been used, making um, felt out of wool for many, many millennia. Um, let's see, the durability, quickly. Wool doesn't get dirty. It resists, it's, it's, it resists dirt and it's fireproof up to a point. It's waterproof up to a point. And if you sculpt or use wool to make a picture or a sculpture, or if you wet felt it, it's virtually indestructible. The only thing that would change that would be if you have a 3D sculpture like this owl, which is only, this is not the one we did in class and it's really not even finished, but um, we, we did this the first week. This is not the one we did. It's one I did uh, you know, about a year ago. But if this is filtered, felt it loosely and it's handled a lot, it will peel. But if it's felted firmly, it really could become an heirloom that you could pass down to generations. It's, it's, not, going to, it's not going to decompose. And uh, wool is amazing, that's all I can say. <laughs> um, Let's see. So I guess that's about it. I thank you very much. It's been so much fun. I just love doing this. I love sharing with the people. I've really been among giants in, in there uh, this week and in the first, first week. People are so skilled, so talented. And I'm just honored to be part of this and be able to share what little I know. And I glean an awful lot from the other people too. So it's a win-win all the way around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. That was wonderful. Do you know the work of Joseph Boyce? He's a German, a German installation artist. His work couldn't be more different than yours. But it fascinated me that he used felt and fat in his installations. He's German. Um, he lived through the war and all of that, but his, his works are conceptual and very problematic. There's one of him locked in a room with some fat and felt and a wild coyote. Oh dear. <laughs> you know, uh, to tell you the difference between what you do and what he, he does, but just because you're interested in felt, you might want to Google him. Okay. His last name is B-E-U-Y-S, Joseph Boyce. And in the 70s and 80s, he was international with these big installations. And usually he was a performer in those installations. The other group that uses felt that interests me are the nomads of the Western Steppe. Mm -hmm. The Mongolian Khan and all those Tartars who came across mm -hmm. from Asia and founded uh, Hungary and you know all those cultures, horse cultures, because mm -hmm. for their domiciles, for their yurts and their horse blankets, they used felt and their garments because many of them lived in cold countries and wool felt was a lifesaver. Right. Uh, the other thing of interest that you said was the gauge of your felting needles. 
that 42 might be a fine. And as the number gets smaller, the needle gets bigger. Am I understanding that right? As the number gets smaller, the needle thickness gets bigger. Yes, it's it's hard for me to grab that, but it's the opposite of what you think it would be. That is correct. Yes. Well, it's it's the same for metalsmiths because that's how wire is gauged. Right. Like the wire that goes through your ear for an earring is 20 gauge. A number one wire, like what I use for diminished diameter forging is as big as my little finger. Mm -hmm. So who would have thought that felting needles and metal wire would be gauged the same way with the higher number being the thinner needle. Right. Glad Thank you so much. Gail. We'll come back to you after everyone else is presented. Okay, thank you. I was introduced to Nancy McKenzie, who happens to be married to a classmate of mine by my dear friend, Mary Lou Grout, Phil Grout's wife. We were looking for a knitting instructor and ML said, oh, Nancy's wonderful. She's so personable. She'll make learning seem like fun. And we are very happy to have Nancy teaching with us for a second year in a row. Nancy McKenzie. Ah, yes. Greetings, everyone. Uh, uh, actually, ML Grout is now in my class, so it, it, it's coming back in full circle. Uh, knitting is old. It's older than I am. It's older than a lot of people. Uh, knitting dates back. Um, there was an, initially a skill with the ancient Egyptians had where they used one needle and the kind of successive loops to create a knitted garment. They would make socks. They'd make toe socks. It's It's very you know, trendy to have toe socks and the Egyptians had it, of course. Um, two needle knitting Egypted in the Islamic cultures in around the, the 1100, year 1100 AD, they would um, go ahead and make beautiful fine work out of cotton, you know, variegated colors, you know, truly beautiful pieces. Most of the knitting, old knitting though, does not exist because Face it, knitting is something you wear for socks. Sitting, knitting is something you wear for for underwear. Knitting is something you wear, so it doesn't survive because it is being worn and being used continually. So knitting has kind of had this long process, and then it ran into me. So I've been knitting for a while, and it's been you know since I've been teaching at Common Ground, it's been interesting and challenging to merge the high tech aspects of Zoom with um, the ancient art of knitting. Um, knitting, though, is very flexible and adaptable by its nature, and it gives us lessons that we can use everywhere. Um, our common ground theme for this year is perspective, and being, which is being aware of how we are, where we are affects our view of a situation. And many definitions of perspective refer to a two-dimensional surface of evaluating a flat surface um, from a particular point. Now, knitting, because it is flexible and is, is a three-dimensional art, it can stretch, twist, and expand to cover many situations. So it's much like how people can expand their view of any situation to add an extra dimension to what their thinking is. So my style of knitting, of course, is nothing fancy, as people will tell you that I <laughs> don't do fancy knitting. Um, I find discarded, unused, unusual fibers um, that I turn into new and sometimes useful things. Um, I my my approach to knitting. Um, Let's see, what did I say? Oh, it challenges my imagination. Um, I don't usually use set patterns. And for the most part, I just start knitting and either watch my creation to see what it wants to become, or I want it, um, blah, blah, blah. Then, or I decide what I want to create and I work out the way to knit that. And it's um, sometimes it's something normal, like a scarf or a cowl. And sometimes it's in something entirely new, like a sea slug that evolved from my skin of fluorescent orange. And at this point, since I've mentioned the sea slug, I'm going to start sharing my screen and my little video, which will come up here. And I will share this with you. And it is just going to quietly play in the background um, with videos of some of the things I've done in recent years. But you will see, you know, dishcloths, something similar, something basic, some scarves, and then we're going to get to the sea slug. I don't have a picture of my sea slug. I gave it away as it was finished at a Civil War um, event and to a seven-year-old kid who walked up and said, you're making a sea slug. And I said, you're right. 
and I finished it off and I gave it to him at the event and he was so thrilled because he got his own sea slug. So that that's the sea slug. So we'll reference this. This is these are other examples of things that I have knit that are in progress, things that are in my knitting bag. Um, I go to rummage sales for my knitting needles and tools. As you can see, I've got an array of all kinds of generations of stuff there. Um, I knit with stray balls and skeins of yarn from you know, thrift stores, rummage stores. Um, the little color bands that come at the bottom of your Oral-B toothbrushes, uh, they become my knitting markers. I slip those in the needles to keep track of what I'm doing if I need to. And I just knit basing with, basically with what I find. All right. My only exception really is the dishcloth. As you can see, the dishcloth is a returning theme. It's the first pattern that I ever knit. Um, I t learned that in a class at um, Carroll County Public Library. They offered a class in knitting and I went and they said, here is the dishcloth pattern. And I started out and I knitted it very intently. And then after the first night, found out that I had knitted it completely wrong. So I had to rip it all out and start over again. So it was a very good learning experience. And that the white one here is my first dishcloth I ever knit. Um, the one that got ripped out in the beginning. Um, this pattern is often the root for my creative flourishes, but I, you know, just, yeah, you know, I'll start with that and go, go into a scarf. There, you'll see a yellow scarf there that actually is the dishcloth pattern knit on big needles with acrylic yarn. But usually I'll just sit there and knit the dishcloth. And I buy my cotton yarn, I go and get it on sale and I have bins of it, but don't tell my husband that I always, so I always have this yarn on hand that I can knit. And then if I need a way to calm myself down and center myself in the world, I grab this ball of cotton yarn, I grab my needles and I start to knit it without thinking about it. Cause I know the pattern it's in my head, it's in my heart. And I just go ahead and start knitting. And the motion of my hands becomes a meditation that I can, you know, that I can use. And it kind of heals me to use this pattern to center myself and calm myself. Um, whether it's a dishcloth, a scarf, or something really esoteric like the sea slug, I tend to give my stuff away. That's why I don't have a whole lot of examples because things have gone to live with other people. Um, I'm sensitive to various fibers, so I can only use cotton, rayon, and silk for myself. So if I knit it from anything else, especially acrylic, which is the predominant yarn you'll find places, I have to give it to somebody. So it goes away, other people, enjoy what I've created. Um, the knitting is a path of creativity for me, um, and it's also self-care. Um, it's a manipulative, I can say this truly, a manipulative skill, and it's got soothing, repetitive mo movements that I can use to regain my perspective on the world around me and in within my life. Now, my goal this week has been to support my students as they learn to knit and refine their skills. Some people are already knitting. They're knitting fantastic, wonderful things. They took the class two weeks ago, and now they're cruising on into my class. Other people, it's the first time they've ever held needles in their hand. So I'm working with them to find not just the mechanical skill, but to internalize the meditative aspects of that skill. And I'm finding that even now with students of mine that are ripping it all apart and ca casting it out again for the umpteenth time on halfway through the week. But they're finding that even as they start to knit, it's much a much more calmer activity for them than it was at the beginning. There is less stress. Their hands know what they're doing. There are still mistakes, but they know they can find their way through. And our goal for this whole week is um, not perfection, it's perseverance that they, when they get finished, they will have not just the skills, but the courage to do something on their own and create something that will fill their own imagination. And it's also a tool to bring calmness to their hearts and expand their own perspectives. So that's what we're working, you know, it sounds like, oh my gosh, we're talking philosophy, but no, it's just knitting. It's just the, the joys of knitting and what people do. And that's how I view knitting in my life and how knitting works for me. Uh, but, we have, as you see, the array of dishcloths and variations on dishcloths and coasters made like dishcloths. Um, that, that's a Swiffer cover right there, um, which is still in progress. And I almost pulled it off the needles today entirely, which was really fun. Baby blankets, which starts from the basic dishcloth pattern. I'm sometimes not the most creative, so I will just work from that. So that's basically Nancy and knitting and come join my class if they let me teach next year. We'll have fun. Thank you, Linda. 
oops let me stop sharing we'll stop sharing now there and there we go no i'm not going to leave the meeting i'm just there thank you nancy i really i really enjoy the little orange slug very cute i like to see it in the shiny shiny wool as you know when I'm not making jewelry, I like to make hats. This year, Tatiana Rachmanina is not teaching hats. She's teaching some wonderful yoga classes. Um, and our theater, uh, our theater maven, Catherine LaPietra is with us. Often she teaches Renaissance costumes and all kinds of fanciful stuff. Uh, making something creative and lovely out of nothing, very inexpensive things. So this year she's teaching a challenging class um, called a hat a day. Tell us a little about that, Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm the crazy theater person slash a lot of people there. Wait a minute. Okay, okay, sorry. I'm also experiencing technical difficulties, so sorry about the lag, but my camera on my, my computer decided to die today. Um, so um, a lot of people there know me as a crazy puppet lady as well. I did puppets for a while uh, for, uh, for Common Ground. Um, and talking about perspective, thank you, Linda, for introducing me as the theater maven. That, that's a new one on me. I like that. But in the theater, you have to look at things from the perspective of both close up and how is it going to look 50 feet away. So that's one of the, the differences that I deal with um, as far as perspective and the angle or direction in which somebody looks at something. Um, and because I'm in the theater, I'm often a Jill of many trades, maybe not master of any, but I have to do a lot. And sometimes I have to do a lot with a little because we have no budget here where I am in Michigan. We have no major and no minor. So our budget is very interesting and we often have to create things out of things we just have sitting around, which is one of the reasons why uh, I like Common Ground because people have lovely, crazy ideas for doing things like that. And uh, it just brings you to the next step. So, so it's cool. So this year I'm a crazy hat lady. Uh, the hats that we're doing, um, this year are not nearly as intricate as the ones that Tatiana usually does. They are, um, they are much simpler. Uh, they're still complex because most hats need at least a starting point for a pattern. But all of these hats start with circles and bands and that's it. So it's just how you put them together to make each different hat. So, um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, hopefully it has not been too bad. I know that Linda managed to use a sewing machine today and I'm very proud of her for doing so. Um, so these are examples of the hats that we have done this week. Um, so the bright red one is made out of one of those straw plastic placemats that you see at the Goodwill or the dollar store until they decided to stop doing it at the dollar store, which was this year after I expected us to be able to get a hold of them. But all it is is a placemat and a piece of ribbon. And you cut the circle out. Nancy just looked up like, what? <laughs> it's just a placemat with a circle cut out of it and a band put on it. And then the other circle. So the outside circle is the brim. And then the ribbon is the crown. And the other circle is the, is the top. And then the beret, which is the next lime green thing, is two circles sewn to each other. Um, my class decided that they wanted to put a band on theirs because Linda had a lot of berets. So we put an inside band on theirs and um, they managed that swimmingly. And then today's hat was a cloche, which is basically, um, I call it the original bad hair day hat. I said it right this time. I usually say it inside out. Uh, because a cloche covers up your entire head. Um, and that's, an, so this is kind of our historical perspective. I think there have been hats since there have been people and somebody decided that they needed to like wear a leaf on top of their head so they didn't get rained on or put a fur around their head so they didn't get cold. So, uh, so I think there's just been hats and they've just been 
created for different purposes and uh, and different uh, materials. So again, placemat, fleece, fleece. The next one, which is kind of a baseball -y cap type, although it's a more square than a baseball cap, is made out of an old t-shirt. Because again, Linda, as Linda says, I like to do recycling and reusing. And then there's the ever-present ubiquitous floppy bucket hat. So those are the hats that we are doing each a day. And so far, uh, one of my students today said, but we're not, you know, we, we don't know what we're doing. I said, well, you manage a hat a day, so you're doing just fine. So I, I think we're doing great. Um, so so that's kind of kind of the it for me. The problem with being a theater person is you do not focus on one thing you cannot. Um, so here at uh, in Michigan, I am the theater director and the costumer. So I have to do a lot in a little bit of space and a little bit of time. And so I have to do it down and dirty and very quickly. So that's my hats this year. So come and join us because it's really, really fun, I think, and easy. So we'll see what we're doing next year. Kind of depends upon what Linda needs me to do. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine's been a very flexible instructor. She can do so many things and she's a good teacher. So Aww. we fill in gaps with, with Catherine. If we don't have another person doing costumes, she does that. The puppetry might, might be ready for a comeback because there were some fantastic puppets. Our, um, my gallery talk partner last night, Keith Taylor, made a wearable, didn't he become a puppet? I he uh, he became a gnome. He became a gnome. That's right. So he he made a a, a a a gnome that was sitting on a mushroom. It was when you walked it. Well, during the student art show, we all got to enjoy that because you walked in the room where Catherine's students were displaying their things, and here was Keith, cute as the devil, gnome on a mushroom. I'm going to brag because I'm kind of allergic to thread. I'm a metalsmith. I've got three sewing machines, they're all broken. I was given one when I graduated high school. I inherited my mother's and my Aunt Virginia's when they passed, and I don't know how to use any of them. So until now. now. Until now. My friend Carrie Will brought hers over for me to use, and it took me 15 minutes to find a button to turn it on. So here's the hat that I made. And you can see this, this is one of those um, ribbons that has wire in the edges, so it's a little stiffer. And I found this gorgeous butterfly pattern to go with my coral placemat. And it's, it was kind of fun to do. And it's a little rakish. So I've already had a friend ask if I'll make one similar to that for her. Yay. And here's the beret. I'm a little slow. This is this is my first sewing experience since I was in college. You're still the fastest hand sewer I know. And so this this is my beret, and this is the ribbon that was supposed to be tucked inside, but I kind of like it on the outside. Just bragging a little bit because. I haven't sewn in so long. One of the things that I wanted to talk with you about is something that's, that's come up in many of these gallery talks. Some artists find the need to plan. Gail's already talked about the fact you don't have to draw to do two-dimensional needle felting. You can grab patterns from the internet. Of course, you can do that for just about anything. Uh, Nancy mentioned that, that she really likes the pattern that she uses for the dishcloths. And with great versatility, she's turned that into scarves and, and um, cup holders and all kinds of things, just using one pattern, kind of working in a series with one pattern. And Catherine has just showed five different patterns. How much drawing do you feel is essential or or where where do these patterns come from well like i said um the 
other than the cloche that we did today, which was basically a football, which is, hold on, let me turn my video back on, um, is the one in the center. That's just basically rounded triangles. Um, but all the rest of them are a circle, a band, and another circle. That's it, literally it. So the straw hat that you did was the outside circle, your butterfly band, and another circle. The beret is just two circles with a band because we added the ribbon. Um, the cap, the baseball cap type is a circle and a band and a bill. So that's just something you freehand. Uh, and then the bucket hat is basically the same principle as the straw hat, just in different fabric and slightly different sizes. And a different fabric so that it flops as opposed to hold stiff. So as far as proportion, the people have to measure themselves right. and try and determine a size. Right. And they have their choice of fabric or you suggest fabric that will work for a particular style. So it, there's a little bit of free form putting together. Right. And with, with Catherine's class, I know there's a definite sequence of, of steps and she suggests this, she's demonstrating what to do. I'll scale with your people, Nancy. I'm, I'm assuming like with Gail, with the felting needles that you have needles of all different sizes. Definitely, definitely. I have needles of, I have these, which are very, very handy if you meet a vampire. You've already got your <clears throat> available. No problem. You can, you know, kill vampires with those. I've got candy stripe needles. I have uh, some itty bitty tiny skinny needles somewhere. Um, this is a stash that came from a rummage sale. I don't know who the lady is whose initials are on the cover but she had a very nice little needle case and she has some very thin little needles from the old days. These are pl actually plastic and they will bend with use, I discovered. Uh, there are sock needles, which are uh, pointed at both ends, which you form them into a circle and knit around in circles with those. Um, there are, these are plastic that are made to look like bone. See how they have the yeah, whoops, let me hold that up. So they have the uh, tip on the end to hold them. There's just a variety of needles of all types and shapes. There are uh, uh, cabling needles that you can, you, you knit things, you put these on there, you carry the cables and then you knit them back in. It's fun and intricate and I'm not doing that to my class. That, they, they have enough pain. I don't want to hurt them anymore. But um, yeah, I've got all kinds of junk in there. I've got to actually sort the bag so I can show my students my stuff tomorrow because it's <laughs> everywhere. I'm actually setting up some right now for tomorrow, getting caught back up so I can show them more stuff tomorrow. <laughs> is, is the rule of thumb, I remember knitting as a child and it, it just, I'm not a thread kind of person. Is the size or the gauge of the yarn comparable to the size or the gauge of the needle? Um, actually, yes, it should be kept proportional. Um, you'll get very different. If this is a size seven needle and a worsted, which is weight four yarn, um, this is this is kind of what you would use standard to match this. You can also use this on really big needles to make a very lacy effect because it's all just big loops around this. It's still knitting. It's still valid. It's just you know it's a different proportion to it. Um, if you're getting to much smaller needles, this is really almost impossible to knit with. And then you go to a thinner yarn. This is a baby yarn, which is about a level three. It goes all the, goes all the way down to a size one, which is fingerling. And it used to stop at, this is a four, there's a five, which was kind of like a heavyweight yarn. Now people have gotten into this big arm knitting and all, and you go up to size seven and 11. And it's like, oh my gosh, what do you do with this? I have Somewhere in one of the bags is, yeah, here's a, here's a very bulky yarn. This is a big bulky yarn. Oh, wow. uh, this is a, hmm, it's not even telling. Oh, this is a six. So this isn't even the bulkiest you can get, but this big thick yarn would go much better with this thick needle than the smaller yarn. But you, you know, you can mix and match and then break all the rules. Um, 
it's like when I do f photography and, you know, when I'm teaching and judging photography, it's like when you're good enough at what you're doing, then you can break all the rules and then it'll be really awesome. So you just have to learn the basic stuff first and then go ahead and defy. <laughs> Uh, Gail, I thoroughly enjoyed looking at your studio and seeing all the beautiful, the library of yarn that you have behind you. Where's Gail? I'm here. <laughs> there, there she is. I'm hiding up in the corner. <laughs> there she is. And it seems that both Nancy and Catherine are either forced to or enjoy bargain hunting and using things for which they were never intended. Uh, but you seem to use, do you spin your own wool? No, no, I don't. I buy all my wool. Um, it's all new, pro new material. Yeah. And it's already dyed, uh, carded, and except for the locks. And there are different kinds of forms of wool. Um, Let's see, this rope-like stuff is called roving and that has a very short staple, easily broken into tiny itty bitty pieces. And that is really good for um, doing the 2D. And then there is, um, there is, well, this, this could also be called roving too, um, but it is, uh, it's got a longer staple on it. You see, if I go like this, the staple is the length of the fiber, okay? And I can't pull it apart easily as opposed to this that I can just, you know, fluff like a cotton ball. So depending on what you're doing, um, <sighs> there's all kinds of different sheep that have different wool and the different wool has different properties. So no, I'm not much of a scrounger actually. Um, it's just not my nature. Uh, and I, I, I admire people who can make something out of not much, you know, I think that's an amazing talent. So I, it's just not, it's just not who I am. I like my stuff fresh and new, but um, I don't know if, if there's anything more I can add. Then there's also, um, besides, besides uh, the wool, there's silk. And the silk is primarily, the silk, the silk does not felt. It is used primarily in wet felting. Um, but you can see that has a really long staple too. And uh, when silk is added to wool in a wet felting piece, it, it, it crinkles. So you get this really, really interesting texture. So anyway, you know, it's interesting you tell me you're not a thread person and people who are thread people really don't get that. <laughs> because if you're a thread person or a yarn person or a fiber person, you know, it's like, um, well, you become a junkie, really. It's like, oh my goodness, I've got to get that, 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 and that. And I guess that's probably why I have so much stuff. <laughs> well, I have hand sewn hats almost every summer for over a decade. I had to dedicate three shelves in a dresser drawer to my collection. Well, that's your signature and your trademark, too, is your little uh, fascinator. So I, I really like that. <laughs> Part of it. So I... I do hand sew, but almost all of my hats have something metal about them, either the framework or, you know, because metal's my thing. I'm a metal junkie. Right, right. <laughs> we, well, all have, we all have our passions. We, we do, we do. Uh, thank you very much for, for all of the interesting things that you shared from your, your own collections to what your students are doing. As, as we well know, many of our audience use the gallery talks as a way of kind of checking off the classes they want to take next year. And along with the predominantly two-dimensional classes that we're offering this year, we did have Nicole Diem taught, Brave Nicole taught a hand-building 
ceramics class. Jim Paulson taught a wonderful found object sculpture class. But because our, our audience just don't have potter's wheels and acetylene torches and cross cut saws at home, we've had to uh, limit to primarily two dimensional uh, works. And we're looking forward to adding the rest back in next season. Hey. Yay. 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 <laughs> yes. Even if we have to go back to masks in the fall, you know. We'll have a mask making workshop. <laughs> will be a healthier people um, being so clean, cleanly for the last year. Uh, tomorrow night, we have a wonderful duet planned for you. Uh, with the advent of cell phone photography and, and makers of cell phones realizing that they've got a computer, they've got a camera, they've got a calculator, that, that little cell phone has revolutionized our world. And uh, maybe 15 years ago or 20, Phil Grout's been with us a long time. Um, and he was mourning the passage of the single lens reflex camera and film and saying what, what a drastic change that was for photographers moving from real film and processing into the digital world. So now that we're firmly ensconced in the digital world, a lot of people feel that they're photographers, but you can always pick up clues. So we have a duet tomorrow between Sasha Lane and Carrie Wolfson. And we're really talking about uh, shoot straight or manipulate with the two of them. So it's going to be, and they have a, a lot of work to, to share with you and a lot of ideas about photography to share with you. So please join us tomorrow for that wonderful gallery talk. I do have some, some good news and some sad news about the plan that we had for Friday night. Uh, Felicia Gee was our Scott Scholar last year, and unfortunately, like none of us, like all of us, she couldn't attend Common Ground and enjoy who we are and what we do and become part of our Common Ground family in real time. But she joined us with a fantastic gallery talk. And as a result of getting to know her, I was really looking forward to getting to know her grandfather, Edward G, a little more. And Felicia and I had planned a gallery talk where she would interview her grandfather. Well, doing videos um, and in-person in interviews and setting that up to broadcast for you takes time. The thing that got in the way of that was a rare opportunity for Felicia and she just couldn't turn it down. As you know, if you saw her work last year, she's a fantastic photographer. She has a phenomenal eye. She's also a performance artist and records her performances on video. Well, she was offered the opportunity to become the most recent of only 21 people ever in the history of US Capitol photography to become an official US Capitol photographer. Wow. She couldn't turn that opportunity down. I'm very proud of her. I'm pleased, but because they were thrilled to have her say yes, they pushed up her employment beginning date mm. and it, it, it just stole the time that it would have taken her to prepare to do the gallery talk for Friday night. So I don't know whether, in the blink of an eye, I can come up with something else. But if you look on the gallery talk chart on the Common Ground website, you will see that we have provided you ample information to go to the website of Felicia and her grandfather, Edward. Edward, in the 60s and 70s, was the only man of color working as a commercial artist in Baltimore. 
and he did fantastic caricatures and illustrations. His work is really awesome. And he has been a major life influence on his granddaughter, who is now courageously stepping out there as a professional in our nation's capital. So please take the opportunity uh, to go online and look at their work. Thank you for the opportunity to share our fiber artists with you tonight. Uh, please don't miss the concert tonight at eight o'clock. Uh, tune in on Friday night. There'll be a lot of uh, artists sharing their work and some of their students' work. Thank you very much. Sorry about the dog. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.